Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Wednesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Joel Elkanen and Dennis Dick. Earnings parade continues today. We'll get to as many as we can. Plus, we have, of course, Apple and Facebook after the bell. Talk about that. Other big story today, of course, is the Fed and their uh, announcement today. So I'm sure that'll weigh on markets. But between that and uh, earnings, we've got a lot to discuss. Plus, Two guests are joining us today. First up, Greg Weldon from Weldon Financial. He would join us at 8.35 and at 8.50. We'll be joined by Larry McDonald. He is a global head of macro strategies at ACG Analytics, also the founder of the Bear Traps Report and a New York Times bestselling author. Before I throw it to Joel, I want to announce that we are just about three weeks out from the Benzinga Global Fintech Awards. If you want everything you want to know about the future of finance and technology in one spot, November 19th in New York City at New World Stages in Midtown. Uh, a lot of reasons to go to the FinTech Awards. Uh, the biggest one probably being that Joel, myself, and Dennis will be there. We will, we will be doing the show live from the event, and we will be doing some education there as well. To learn more, go to fintechawards.com. Now, Joel, what's happened here overnight? <laughs> Tight range here, Spencer. Only a six-point range in the futures ahead of the big Fed meeting. Pre-market high, 3038. Really nothing there. Your daily pivot at 37 and a quarter. Pre-market low, 3032. That's just above your lows from Monday and Tuesday. So tight range, six-point range overnight. Um, if we start to go into motion to the upside, uh, your old time high was made yesterday at 46 and a quarter. And unless we break Tuesday's low at 29.50, not looking for any downside here in the market. Uh, we have crude trading up seven cents at 55.61, just hanging out here in the 55 handle. Gold trying to reclaim 1500 up $5.70 at 1496.40. Silver, Challenging eighteen dollars, up eleven point nine cents at seventeen ninety five, and uh, bit Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin rally has ended or not ended, but ten thousand ran into that roadblock at ten thousand, now down one hundred and twenty five dollars at nine thousand one hundred in ninety. Let's bring in our Edmonton Oiler fan. Oh. Dennis. So this was a rough night. And if you see, you know, say you're having a bad hair morning and that it was a rough night. It started actually it started out well because I got a steak dinner from Joel paid up last yes, night. You did. So he did pay me back one of the steak dinners. He only owes me 13 now, but actually it's three. He owes me three more steak dinners. So he paid one off last night. Excellent steak dinner there. What was the name of that restaurant? We'll give him some promotion. Down, downtown. Uh-oh. Spencer. Downtown downtown Louis, sorry. Downtown Louis. So then we went to the Red Wings game. The Oilers decided they wouldn't start playing hockey until 10 minutes left in the game. Uh, the highlight of the game, they ended up losing 3-1 to one with the empty net goal. The highlight of the game had to be Ric Flair. Right, Joel? <laughs> Woo! Ric Flair. So they showed, just on the Jumbotron there, they showed just a video of Ric Flair for like a split second early in the game doing his patented woo. Anyways, the entire game, the crowd just kept wooing the entire game. So I blame the Oilers' loss because it really got the crowd-inspired Ric Flair. I blame the Oilers' loss on Ric Flair. Okay. This was Ric Flair's fault because he kept the crowd inspired the entire game. All it took was one woo. Wow. That's <laughs> a bad <laughs> woo. So anyway, so that was my night until I got home at 11.45. And then my daughter, the two-year-old daughter, decided to wake up at 1 o'clock. The boy decided he would wake up at 4 o'clock. I finally get him back to sleep at like 4.40. And then the daughter decides, oh, she'll wake up at 5. And my wife's a little bit under the weather here too. So put all that together, it equals very little sleep. So it equals a very tired dentist on this show this morning. Woo! Right. <laughs> yeah, and I looked... Um... I looked we for have to his, pay Ric Flair royalties for saying woo. I don't know, but if we want to, his uh, appearance fee is twenty to thirty grand. 
So if we uh, want to bring Ric Flair on the pre-market prep show to go, woo, it's $30,000. Uh, well, maybe for something, um, maybe we could get him cheaper if we just get one woo from him. One woo. And I don't know, maybe we'll get him on. I'll I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. But, uh, pull off because I want a woo. Uh, Spencer, are you downgrading Grubhub too? I just want to know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think everybody in the whole, and the grandma downgraded Grubhub. How many am I counting here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, at least nine. Nine downgrades. Nine? Nine now? Nine. I see nine. I saw eight. Is it nine oh, now? now? They're now growing. It's now it's nine. DA Davidson, Wedbush, Stiefel, JMP Securities, Mizuho, Cowan, oh, my my BTIG. Bad. You know what? I stand Goldman. It, it is. It eight. looks like eight to me. Benchmark. It's also benchmark that yeah. looks like they lower their price target. Yeah, but they're maintaining their buy. So they're everybody looking. else went to neutral. Thanks, analysts. Thanks. Thanks. You all had a buy on it when it was $58 before the report. Now we all go to neutral when it's 31 or 33. Joel, what are your thoughts? I've never seen, I don't think I've ever seen in my 20 years of trading, I'm not sure I've ever seen eight downgrades in one day. I'm not sure I've ever seen that many. uh, Maybe. It's been a long time. I think they were all listening to uh, Benzinga's pre-market prep yesterday when I ranted about getting Taco Bell delivered or something like that. Uh, (laughs) So now that we get eight downgrades and the stock's down 50%, basically a two for one split and just over one trading session. What do we do? Well, the old me would be just trying to pick a bottom here. Me too, but we got to break that habit. So yeah. So the new uh, us, the new us will say, man, uh, we'll wait for it to stop going down. Yeah. Number one, uh, if I was short, like let's say I had a big short position on and I was did not cover yesterday and I saw these nine downgrades, I would be out there with bids. I mean, there is no doubt I'd be out there. Just the fading mentality that I have. Uh, pre-market low, 3145. Maybe maybe it will pull a um a uh beyond meat and you know maybe I'll say hey they're supported 2850 good support monthly support but maybe we'll whoosh like 3005 or 3010 or something Hit like the that the 30 yeah and then and then come back over 30 and rally but uh the monthly charts don't give you anything to lean on here no they so, don't 30 16 now 2942 if i had to pick a low of the day right now 29 two more points down two more points of pain i'd say 2950 come and get me I, I don't again. have any precedents here, so I don't know. I've never seen eight downgrades in one day following an earnings report. We do have some precedents because we saw the five upgrades of AT and T basically for three in, in the in a matter of four days. I think it was. This was like two years ago, and AT and T that marked the top. So can eight downgrades mark the bottom on Grub? I don't know. It's a pretty bad report, so I'm not going to say that. I just say I'm not getting more bearish because I had eight downgrades. I was bearish yesterday after you saw that report. The report was a disaster. So we'll leave it at that. I'm not calling the bottom on grub. I'll just say if you're holding out for more downside, wait for wait for that 2942. Get out there 2950. I mean, their hat shorts have to cover at least at some time here. But what a horrible, horrible performance for the stock. But uh, let's go from um, bad to good. And has GE turned the corner here? 189 stocks reporting this morning, and we start with. General Electric. You know what? I don't even mind that. It's been a while since we started with GE and given them some love. Um, what's the report? Tell me the report, Spencer, yeah. before I give you my bearish scenario. Uh, EPS, 15 cents versus 11 cents. Nice earnings beat. It's a guidance. And, uh, sales came in 23.36 first $22.93 billion. Um, what They also increased their uh, free cash flow forecast for the year. Hmm. That's all good news. Does it mean the stock's going to turn around and go back to 12 bucks? Uh, no. You're going to get to 10 I think $10 is going to be a big, big level for General Electric. And I don't have my book open. I thought I had my book open. I'm sure I opened my book. What happened? It's closed now. This computer is not being my friend here. Anyways, okay. I guess I did not open my book. Um, I just imagined that in my tiredness. So I got to imagine there's some size of 10 
Yeah, JV Spec says there's uh, some huge, huge offers in town. I gotta think ten bucks. Seven hundred. JV Spec says seven hundred and fifty-five thousand shares for sale. Ted, which isn't much considering it's already trade eight point seven million. But that's probably gonna grow, and maybe they're not holding their entire hand. Maybe it just does the, the scenario where the opposite of grub, where it just kind of takes out the ten, goes ten oh five, ten ten, that comes back down through it. That is where I would say I'd be concerned. But in any regard here, stock is still a dog. Dogs do bark every once in a while, and that's what we're seeing here. I can't really get that excited about this. Maybe if it's over ten, but I, I think I think it I think it might I think it's gonna struggle with ten. Uh, 8.7 million shares have traded. So that should Big be, able, yeah, be able to sweep out, uh, a lot of the book there. Cause I'm sure there's sellers at nine quarter, nine thirty. What was the close yesterday? The close yesterday under $9. So, whew, uh, a lot of stock to, no, no, it didn't. 907, multiple closes in 907. I'll just keep an eye on that pre-market high, uh, 983. I'd call 983 up to $10, you know, a sell zone, uh, if you're buying this thing off the open, let's say you buy it 965, 970, you don't want to see it in 949. You want to see it if you're so inclined to buy this gap up here. Uh, 10 bucks, 1008. Just be careful if you blow through 10 and it looks like it's going to 20, you go 1002, 1005, and then all of a sudden, boom. You're back at 998, then all those uh, 10 sellers are stuck. So we'll see. Yeah. A close over 10 would be very, very impressive today. Let's see what it does. I, I'm not I'm not a believer, not in General Electric yet, sorry. And I'm still listening to that John Inch guy. Okay. So when John Inch gets bullish, I'll get bullish. And what about Steven Tusa? Yeah, we like him too. Is it Steven? Is that his first name? Tusa's last name from JP Morgan. Yeah, is I think Steven? it is. I believe I don't know. All right. Okay, so, so right. last yeah, night we had a two lot of stock. When we were busy eating steak and watching the Oilers lose, and we yeah. had multiple stocks reporting, AMD probably being the, the biggest stock from last night. It looked like it was down a lot more than it was, so buy the dip coming in on this one as well. Give us a report, Mr. Israel, and Joel will talk about that after hours. After. A- AMD's Q3 report was, it was, uh, okay, 18 cent EPS is in line. Sales, 1.8 billion. Was, they missed by a hair there. Uh, the Q4 sales guidance coming in, essentially in line. Everything, it, it was a slight miss, but everything was more or less in line or, or around there. Nothing great. <clears throat> so stock out the beats. Joel, how low did we get? Oh, well, first you went to 34.65. Oh yeah, we ripped it first a buck and a half on it, and then he went down to thirty-one sixty-four. <laughs> ten, we just tidy, tidy little ten percent fall after that. And then you went to thirty-three and a quarter. Then you went back down to thirty-two. Wow, you know why? Because yeah. I wasn't trading last night. I couldn't, you, you know, if I was trading and providing liquidity to all these buyers and sellers, I'd been actually those moves wouldn't have been as extreme. Uh for the, the regular news session, algo is nuts. Yeah, for the well, where are we trading at? Oof, we're trading in the 32 handle. So you can down forget, 30 cents. Yeah. yeah. Um what's a good idea? 34 bucks. It's two tops last two days. Yep. 3390, 3390. I'm gonna say 3390 is major resistance. If for whatever reason we're going to rally mode, that's where I'd be concerned. You have all the toss back in July and August around 34 as well. It's a very important day for it. This needs to turn around and get green. If it decides just to start leaking and go red, then you think, okay, well, 50% retracement on the recent move was 28 to 34. Maybe eventually go back down yeah. to 31. So this is, you know, 34, 31. That's my range for this thing right now. 31 obviously being more of the buy zone because of the 50% retracement of the recent move. 34 being the sell zone because of the double top up there. There you mm, go. I'll Quick keep an eye analysis. on the close. I'd keep it. I mean, if you're trying to scoop this thing up off the open in the 32 handle, you're looking for a quick dish. Uh, keep an eye on that close, 3303. Your last pop took you right up to that area yesterday. Uh, your two-day low is right in that area. So I'll play a little bit uh, little bit tighter, and I'll, I'll say uh, that 3303 short-term resistance here in AMD. With 189 stocks reporting here today, and obviously a ton of stocks been reporting last night, night if you want a specific stock let us know in the chat because otherwise we're just going to pick on the stocks that we want to talk about i want to go ea sports this is just for obviously the e-gaming it's a stock Uh that everybody kind of likes i mean this stock sold off there yes likes to talk about that is um sold off pretty significantly into the report yesterday was up at 97 and then sold off and closed near the lows 
trading down a little bit here. What they do after hours when uh, when we were not watching. Yeah, we were not watching. That is true. Uh, well, what they do in the numbers and then uh, Q2, the uh, gap EPS, I didn't see an adjusted figure. The gap EPS was $2.89. The adjustment was probably somewhere around there because the estimate was at $0.85. Cents. Uh, net sales for the quarter, $1.348 billion. Uh, net bookings were higher than uh, estimated. Their full year 20 uh, sales guidance coming in at $5.41 billion. Dollars and their gap EPS for the full year, their guidance at nine dollars and fifty-seven cents. Oh, there's the adjusted number. Adjusted number was ninety-seven cents. So ninety-seven cents versus an eighty-five cent estimate. So they beat on the Q2 EPS uh, and beat on the sales and a some full year guidance sales and EPS figures for us. Can we show that after hours chart? Because I'm curious on myself what this. It got is. low. It got low. They it went low, high. Get low, get low, get low. If went to ninety-nine forty-three. And 99.43. And 89. 10 point after hours range. These things are crazy. These news algos are crazy. They ripped us up to 99 bucks on the initial number. What are they reading? Man, know. there's my money. Every day there's money being made fading this news algo. We just got to fade the news algo. Crazy. Hmm. Trading $99? What are they thinking? All those tops up there? This report they, wasn't they that great. Said, they also said that they're, they're not uh, shipping... A, a NBA live game next year. Uh, they canceled a, a, a game, a big game. But I don't know. I mean, that wouldn't. If that you much. buy calls and puts and you're not trading this after hours action with that, I mean, it's giving you basically a free look at the other way. Like the thing gets up to 98.99, sell stock against your call. The thing goes down to 89.90, you buy the stock against your put. I mean, hindsight's 2020, obviously. But, you know, if you're sitting there with calls and puts now, they're basically going to be worthless. I mean, the thing's down only 60 cents. I don't know what they were going for, but it seems like all the good volatility happens right on the initial number. And that's where you see these things maybe move up to their expected move quickly and then come back in. What was the expected move on EA? Let's go grab it. Let's go grab it real fast. I'll grab it while Joel does his technical. Uh, p- p- keeping an eye on the close here, down 61 cents. The close and the low right next to each other yesterday, 94.37, 94.41. So no green until you get to that level. On the downside here, bit in a trading range for the better part of October. The bottom of that trading range has come in at, nine, let's just call it 92.40. So I've been looking at that as potential support. So 92.40 uh, up to your closing price from yesterday. That'd be your resistance 94.41. Uh, but still, $6.50? Still... Is that yes. not insanity? Who is paying $6.50 for a straddle on this? This thing doesn't move $6.50 for months. And now it's down only 60 cents. That's what the expected move was. 650 i just looked it up that's insanity way too much it was way 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 too. maybe they're expecting some news on a gamer or something but that was expected it was way too much i would have saw that i would have wrote that straddle joel doesn't uh, that seem crazy yeah it does i mean especially in the trading those range, moves look been... crazy after hours and those were expected by the options traders they, they didn't even get to the expected moves. I mean, it went up four bucks. It didn't go up six, and then went down ten. Yeah, no shot I, on that one. It's crazy, uh, I don't even understand. I don't understand how people make money buying options. I can't understand it. I tell you, I you know, I first started trading like back in 99, 2000, 2001. I used to buy options too. I learned pretty quickly. It's like it's hard making money buying options. Des, can you explain uh, for one of our listeners the uh, ex- uh, expected move? Quickly, just go to your options chain. So look at, you know, whatever options chain you got there. Go to the November strike, which is the ones that are ex- the closest to expiration, which is November 1st. And then just go like 94.50. And you can look at where the calls and the puts were bid offered at the close. So you just add them both up. So the 94.50 calls with 32.50 bid, 33, 3.35 offer. And the 94.50 puts were 3.20 bid and 3.35 offer. So almost identical at the close so i kind of go in the middle of that 330 330 rounding a little bit and you get six dollars and sixty cents you know if you want you can use the last some people like to use the last then it you know, might give you a different number but basically on the bids offers at the close um if, if the, this number is correct that i'm looking at it was six dollars and sixty cents uh interesting comment here for elliot wave day he said the expected move is valid until friday 
Well, yeah, obviously. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's when the options expire. The expire. <laughs> <laughs> <Of course>. It's <laughs> expected. But this all priced in. I mean, you're not going to get much more volatility than the print, right? Yeah. So yeah. The, the, the numbers. So we, we try. We don't have daily option expiration, so we can't look at, you know, what, you know, so you get two more days of time value. So I guess you could knock 10, 20 cents off for the time yeah, value if you day. want to really get picky about it. But, you know, we, we got the closest options to expire, expiration date, and that's going to give you pretty much the bulk of that options premium is all going to be in the earnings print because, you know, other things being equal, if there wasn't an earnings day, those options would have been traded for 20, you know, maybe, maybe 50 cents. So, you know, maybe you can knock off 50 cents. I, I get what you're saying. You know, it's a, you yeah. have a little bit of time value left. For two but days. if you didn't get it off the So print. if there was no earnings, those options wouldn't have been zero. They would have been worth something. They would have been worth 20 or 30 cents. So then you can maybe knock off 60 cents saying that was just time value. So it's really the expected move is only about six bucks. I get that. If you really oh, yeah. want to be picky about it. Okay. All right. Do you want to uh, you want to continue here? Uh, GE's printing a printing a nine eighty one here. Trying the ten ten. Uh, bucks, JV Spec says there's I think three quarters of a mil at ten bucks. Yeah, that's huge. That's Even though it's trade a lot of volume, that's still a big number. And like we said, there could be some more hidden there. So who knows. Uh, back to the earnings parade here. Actually, sure. let's just stick with it. what's going on with ATVI. Why is Activision Blizzard trading up? I want to know because I own that in my long-term portfolio. It didn't report, did it? They, no, but they 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 had some news or they released some information. They said on a game that, or something. Yeah, they said that uh, their Call of Duty Modern Warfare delivered six hundred million dollars in sales in the first three days. Okay, and that's why you're seeing ATVI trade up fifty-five fifty. Somebody is just loading the boat. This fifty-five fifty is an iceberg here. What we mean by that is showing a hundred shares, and somebody just hit it for six thousand, six thousand, twelve thousand. It's not moving. So this fifty-five fifty is a big fish. He wants stock, or, or she wants stock. We don't know if it's a he or yes, she. we can't. Or, the, or maybe it's an it. Maybe it's a bot. So we don't even know if it's a human. But anyways, fifty-five fifty <laughs> wants some stock. We don't know how big that is, but I can tell you right now, big iceberg there right now, bidding fifty-five fifty in ATPI. Uh, if you want to hold out for this one for the recent high of the move, then whew, you got a ways to go. Uh, fifty-seven fifty-two was your high print on the twelfth. I spotting a couple sellers here at fifty-six. Uh, two highs there, consecutive days uh, back on the thirteenth and sixteenth of September. So a little bit of a target there. Uh, fifty-six. Also, your recent um, high of the move has been fifty-five. Oh no, fifty-six oh three. So. 56, 56, 56, a big level of clear. Test the high of the move up at 57 and change. Jump over so Dennis, many. Dennis, are you taking a sell on this thing? I mean, no. You're gonna I just sell all my stocks and then just go spy on my long term yeah, portfolio. Yeah, we I don't have to worry about analyzing stocks. Because like I said, I already, you know, I trade so much with the two kids, it's hard to do my long-term investing and efficiently manage it. I give it like no time. So uh, I thought I'm already half indexed anyways, though. So and a lot of the stocks is just fun. No, I'm not thinking about selling ATVI right now. I still okay. believe in e-gaming. Okay. What about Wingstop? Poor Kolb. Uh, do we have to cover Wingstop? Yeah, we were out with Matt Kolb last night, and he was thinking this was going to go down. I'm thinking it's not going down. At least it's not going down yet. It's trading up here. So it's up $3.81, W-I-N-G. He was uh, telling us about the nosebleed valuations in this, which I see. Right. Uh, I, but I, for whatever I, reason, the stock just continues to get love. It's getting love here this morning. Report must have been okay. I, I mean, yeah, high valuation doesn't mean anything when the report, when, when the quarter is really good, and that's what it was. So Q3 EPS, uh, 20 cents for a 17 cent estimate. Uh, sales, 49.8 million versus 49.1 million. And the key number here they're raising their full year eps guidance uh by a couple cents the range was 72 to 74 cents now it is 75 to 77 cents so and same store sales around 12 percent. so good good numbers across the board there for wings up the good news for Kolb is i see all kinds of resistance up at 90 so i don't think this is going to be one that's just going to turn around and rip 10 bucks uh, the bad news is this thing's already trading up, and obviously there was a little bit of washout print going into this yesterday. When you can see the thing trading down eight two seventeen, so um, um, I think it's going to be range bound. I say the lower end. I, I I think you're going to run into resistance up at ninety. I'm not chasing it here, but uh, I don't chase anything. Eighty nine. I, I call it eighty nine. That's your pre market high. Then I see a daily high at eighty nine twenty seven. Dennis has a psychological ninety dollar number. 
Uh, but yeah, new low of the move yesterday, and then they come out with this report. So I don't know. I think a lot of people be that have been picking it up on the cheap the last three or four days are going to look at this as a little gift. Uh, really got to blow through 90, whole 90 to have one of those crazy four, five, six point up days. 30 up 418, but get 90. I don't know. You might have a little, some few shorts on the run too. Uh, with this one closing right, uh, well, you made a new low for the move yesterday. But have you, has anyone ever eaten a wing at Wingstop? No, no, actually. Where where are they? Is there any in Detroit? There's, yeah, there's one around here. I think I just have never been there. Okay, never been there either, so I can't comment on the wings. Okay, all right. Also reporting, just so many stocks. Let's go away from the reports for a second. Let's go Johnson Johnson because this is a big story from last night. Stock got halted before the close. And this is why, you know, I always say stay diversified in your trading portfolio as well, because sometimes stocks get halted actually during the day, even if you're an intraday trader. And it did get halted just around uh, about 30 minutes before the close. They came out. What was the news, Mr. Israel? So recall, uh, if you recall, they had a recall of uh, baby powder products. They announced yesterday, right before the close, after a whole bunch of new tests, they found no asbestos in their recalled samples of baby powder. So no the asbestos, asbestos worry for the talcum powder was unfounded. No asbestos is what they said. All right. This has obviously got hit very hard when we've heard about this before. And now they're saying there's no asbestos. So whether the story is over yet or not, I don't know. But it's getting back a lot of those losses that it suffered just recently. So 132.85, it's up four bucks here in the pre-market. I see all kinds of overhead supply up there, 134 to 135. So again, yeah. not chasing j and J. I I would be more inclined to fade this move. The yeah. other one I like wasn't doing anything on like Wingstop, but I'm actually intrigued to potentially fade this move. Looking in the book for some size, I see forty four thousand at one thirty five. Not getting Four ways away. I don't think you're getting that. How high do we get here after hours? Uh, we got to one thirty four ninety nine. Holy this size, guys. Okay, so after I'll, I'll go. You know, whoever's running the after hours algo that's running on the news, add the book into that. You know, and take a look. And if you're buying a huge size all the way up to where there's a big buyer, in all likelihood, you just bought the top. So 135. Seller, you, mean, you mean seller. A big seller. Yes. Sorry. 130. It's time tired. The Oilers lost last night too. 135 seller. So 44,000 shares. I mean, you can't be going and buying this thing up six bucks right into that seller. You're probably buying it at the high. So the book works. I mean, you know, at, and obviously, you know, a lot of people don't subscribe to the book and they say it's useless intraday. There's a little bit of argument there because intraday you have a lot of high frequency orders that are all just moving around. But I say when you look at it in the pre-market, you get a lot of good information because these orders are like the real orders, the solid orders. The high frequency traders don't have orders just sitting out there all pre-market here. They're not even, they're, they're trading in the pre-market, but they don't have orders on New York bucks sitting there because it's not even open yet. It's a waste of their time. So this gives you a feel for where the real liquidity is. That's why I like the book of the pre-market to look at it. And I see 135, 44,000 shares. And I think maybe there's more there. Maybe there's 100,000. It's still early. Maybe you know, they haven't even filled the whole book up there yet. So I see that as major resistance up there. Obviously, coinciding with the after hours high, I'd be selling uh, everything I had if I was up at 130, in the 134 handle, if I had it. Uh, let's call support, uh, that 130 area. Cause that was the area of the last two highs. So if you're short in this thing and you want to see it come in, uh, old resistance, new support here on the short term, on the long term, I think, I don't think you're going to get back up to 134.99. You need a lot of stock to move it up to that area. Uh, so I'll go look for an intermediate level ahead of that. And 134.39. That was your high on October 18th. I don't think you see that either. I think you got, I bet even 133. Let's see if we can even clear 133 off the open, but been real quiet consolidation here over the since that 4 a.m. open, 132.75. So I don't know. I'd be more inclined to short this on a rally than try and buy it. But if it did get that 130 at any time today, I think that would be your support. Spenner says we got to check out the after hours in Zendesk, Zebra EN, and it is trading up still $3.59. Did report, so Mr. Israel is going to give us the numbers, and Joel is going to tell me about some crazy <laughs> after hours action. Yeah, Zendesk with a nice beat for the third quarter, 12 cent EPS versus a 6 cent estimate sales of 210 million versus 207 million. So, like I said, a 
good Q3. The Q4 sales guidance coming in above estimates. Full-year sales guidance also above estimates. So good across the board in the headlines for ZEN yesterday. What did this do? Oh, it went to 61.50. Right on the initial print. Yeah. They knocked down another $5. Yep. What I don't so what was bad in this report, Spencer, that there was a reasoning for this? I I don't know. I, I can't understand <laughs> it anymore. The only thing here, you know what? I haven't seen the release. You you never know in the release where it'll say and how it'll display information and what they'll say. So um what like I don't get I, I honestly don't get like how I don't get how this new the, these guys are making money trading these headlines. Maybe we're just selective perceive you know selective perception. Maybe they're making it on a lot of trades, and we're just pointing out the ones they're not making it on because maybe they're obviously doing them all. But I mean, it looks to me like somebody just threw away five points on this immediately because it wasn't even down there for how long was it down there? Ten minutes. Ah, uh, before it started ripping higher. See, I keep a, I just keep a fifteen minute chart here. Yeah. So let me. Uh, Maybe it's uh, a little longer. I'm just trying to ballpark it from your chart. I wasn't I, watching the action last night. No, I know, I know. Let me, uh, let me zero in here. Uh, let me change my settings. Uh, let's go to five minutes. Uh, on that five minute bar, it, it, it was down there for a little bit. I mean, you had five, at least five to ten minutes to buy it between sixty one, sixty, and sixty four. You had some time. You had some time in there. Uh, 71 here. That's, uh, I'm not sure. Is there hit 71 on several occasions? 71 right on the kisser. And then you just came up just under 71. So I'll use that as a target. You get above 71. Where do we go on the dailies? Uh, 71. Supply. Yeah. 71, 91, and then 73, 26. But yeah. There's some room. I don't see a real easy level, but you know, if you take your Jeff Mackey purple crown, maybe when man would give Jeff Mackey a lot of promotion. You're probably on that downtrend from the last three months. You're probably around like 70 to 71. Let's see how it does with that trend. Does it fail at that trend? It does run overhead supply. I mean, it's a very important day for it. If it can get up over $70 and start going 71, then you think, oh, we got room to 75. If this thing opens at 70 and runs to 71 and then comes back down through 70, then you think, ooh. That last night, that thing really fell. There could be some air in there, too. So uh, very important where this opens, that it doesn't cross back through the open. Um, Eduardo Ramos wants to know, more upside in Bank of America. Um, the banks have not, been just running. Yeah, this is not investment advice, but no, I'll tell you, yeah. it seems like seems like someone's ganging up here. This is called 3220. Yesterday's high, 214. The other high, 22. 32 23 so chewing through a seller at that area so i'd say you get above that you know 32 and a quarter maybe look for 32 and a half but uh for the most part this you know kind of opens up to 33 after this this is a classic big move up a couple quiet days of consolidation so the trend is still your friend here uh fed meeting today you know who Huge. knows what they're going to say about rates Huge. so See what happens at 32 and a quarter. Can you see thing in the book? I mean, I see 32, yeah, 14. Bank of America, I'll go check yeah, it's kind of useless to look because there's size. Mm. Like there's every, size everywhere on Bank of America, but maybe there's some more size. Oh, my goodness. It's just littered with yeah. size. There's so much size everywhere in the stock. So 32, 20, 10,000 shares, 32 and a quarter, 11,000 shares. You get up to 32, 50, you got 330,000 shares. You know, if you get up to 33, it's 530,000 shares. I mean, Bank of America can chew through that. It does a lot of volume, but these are still, it still takes big buying pressure to push it through. How's like the book looking on the downside? Open because it's been running. So okay. these are like that's GTCs inter- yep. and it's kind of went up through it. So it's wide open. So that's where, you know, if it decides to get some sellers, there's not as much liquidity at all on the buy side as there is on the sell side. You know what? So, you I, know, you look at this and you think oh, see, the path of least resistance actually down. But it all depends on what's the Fed's going to say. I mean, yeah. every, everything, the, nothing is going to move. Nothing is more important, you know, than the, the financials when you're talking about a Fed decision. So and, those are uh, the stocks that are, are impacted the most. And uh, does you just make a good point? Uh, back on the floor when you were holding the deck, you know, you would have your offers and your buy stops on the upside. You've have your bids and your sell stops on the downside. And the market would always clear out the book eventually. It would you take out all those offers, 
take out all those buy stops and then it would start to fill up again and then the bottom of the book will come so it's filling out the top of the book here let's see how how much uh how high it can go 3305 if you're really holding out here that was uh that was a monthly high you had a few months pretty ago. thick yeah pretty thick yeah i see some tough sledding but again remember tlt is the important thing here so as tlt goes down typically banks will go up and it's not a coincidence that the TLT has dropped in October from 145 to 137 and stocks like Bank of America went straight up in that same time period. There is just a nice inverse correlation between the TLT and your banks. Write that down. All right, 836 here. I'm going to grab our first guest of the day, Greg Weldon from Weldon Financial, uh, former floor trader in the gold and silver pits, a uh, longtime market veteran. Uh, Greg, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Can't okay. see you. Can't great. see you, but I can hear you. How's it going this morning? Uh, it's going great. How are you guys doing? Doing okay. Good. Doing okay. Hey, Greg, just real quick before we get into the market stuff, uh, being a floor guy, you know what I'm talking about, you know, holding that deck, you know, and on the upside. Did it seem like the market, you know, no matter what exaggerated moves there were, man, it, Mr. Market always find a way to clear out the top of the deck and then have it rebuild up again on the downside. And do uh, you, you remember that from your days on the floor? Sure. Stop hunting is what we used to call it. And, <laughs> you know, this is 35 years ago in the World Trade Center. And it kind of led to something of a credo, you know, that I followed for three decades. And, you know, without being too verbose, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, the market is going to screw the most people possible. That's always what's going to happen. And, you know, yeah, when you, you know, the, that, that was a little bit of the difference though, back then was you had locals and you kind of saw the order flow and you knew who was on which phones, you knew who was doing what, so you could kind of run their orders. And I think that's a little bit more difficult here because you just don't have that kind of personal connectivity in the pit that you used to do given electronic trading. But, um, I totally, oh, yeah. I totally get what you're meaning. Sure. I, I didn't used to see those orders rolling off the desk. You know, and you would actually get it to your bro, you know, okay, you know, you see an order, nothing wrong with that. I mean, a little bit harder to do that uh, electronically, but uh, let's talk, let's talk Fed here a little bit. Uh, you know, they've, they've, they've walked the rates down here. Uh, it's what Mr. President wanted. Here we are coming to the Fed meeting. I'm looking, they're going to say, yeah, we're going to lower now, but we're going to be data dependent. The market's going to get all scared here, market at all time highs. Maybe a little chance to cool, you know, take the foot off the throttle for rates. Uh, what are you looking uh, uh, for the Fed today? Well, I think that you have to be. I, I mean, it's it seems generally accepted they're going to cut rates again, and I, I don't. I'm not sure about that. I think if you're going to get any kind of surprise here, <laughs> it might be remembering. You have to remember that Powell is not Greenspan, Bernanke, Yellen. Powell is not a student of the depression of the 20s. He's a student of the inflation of the 70s. He's told us this, okay? The core rate is at 2.4. It's above the Fed's target, which is for PCE. And if you correlate kind of the, the math, it equals a PCE at 2%, all right? You're going to have an energy dynamic here in the fourth quarter, particularly in December, let's not forget. Last year, you went from $76 to uh, 42 bucks in crude oil at the, in the fourth quarter of last year. That's going to reverse now in terms of the calendar effect on the data, CPI, particularly the headline rate, which is now below the core rate, which is somewhat unusual when you see inflation potentially rising here. So, you know, for the Fed to come in here and just cut rates when the stock market's at almost new highs, you have a trade deal at least on the table. Uh, you know, if they're going to do it, it would be in the context of what they said after the last cut when you heard Powell basically use the words global and international. Because, again, and I think we talked about this last time I was on, and it was saying eventually this would happen, and now it has, where the Fed is the central banker to the world. You know, when you have the BOJ and the ECB frozen, look at the data out of Japan this week alone, the inflation data. Deflation is very strong in Japan and what's the BOJ supposed to do about that? Their balance sheets are already almost you know, 700 trillion yen. So it's not so much about the US because if it were, they would not be cutting rates right here, I don't think. And, and just to satiate the stock market, which is almost at new highs, I, I don't see how that plays at all. All right, uh, let's move on to uh, crude. Uh, you had uh, the upheaval uh, with the uh, Ramco facility, and everyone thought crude was going back to 70 bucks, came back down to the lower 50 area, 
kind of in the middle of the range here. Well, it's not kind of toward, nah, I guess the middle of the range. You did get up to 64 here. Uh, just quiet consolidation here in this uh, up and down crude market. Yeah. And I mean, you got it right on the, you nailed it right on the head. I mean, it is, you know, it spiked up, it spiked back and it's kind of back to where you started. So you have to kind of scale back and look at the fundamentals and man, you're coming at it from kind of, I might say three different angles. Number one, U S inventories are ample. Okay. Uh, you have production at record highs, you know, 12.4, 12.5, 12.3 million barrels a day, uh, you know, putting us ahead of Saudi Arabia, Russia, so on and so forth. But then you have kind of the swap rates, which are showing us some backwardation in the sense that those inventories are not being held at the delivery point against the WTI futures contract, which is in Oklahoma. So that's kind of a, a bit of a dichotomy right there. So the U.S. situation would seem to be not quite as supportive. Uh, but having said that, OK, some of the bearish uh, thought processes, the people that are bearish, their, their thought process is you know, that demand is slower than expected and could, you know, be even lower than expected. Well, that may be true, but demand is still growing. Demand is not contracting. And when you look at the international situation with what's going on in Iran and Venezuela and sour grades and a whole bunch of stuff you can throw into the hopper here, you come out with a situation that is actually more supportive. So I take it from there and then I want to look at the products. And right now you have some really interesting dynamics, heating oil in particular, Low inventories, a big deficit relative to last year. You just had the warmest uh, uh, summer in the Northeast on record. All right. What we know to be true in physics, okay, what's happening with this planet and the Schumann resonance scale, and I could get really technical and I won't. The bottom line is the polarization of everything is widening. It's not that it's necessarily global warming, which it is, but you also have record cold. You have record Arctic blasts. You have record floods and record droughts, you know, so the degree of polarization is so great that when you see something like a record warm Northeast summer, I mean, the risk is a record cold Northeast winter and the market is not prepared for that. It's not priced for that. You have a deficit in heating oil, natural gas, a little bit of a different story, but still priced such that these things are cheap uh, relative to the risk reward on a fundamental basis. If you get any kind of demand push based on weather. Then you throw in gasoline because gasoline had kind of been oversupplied and it was underperforming. But because now you're pumping out so much heating oil to try and catch up to your normal seasonal build ahead of the demand side season, uh, gasoline all of a sudden is coming off pretty hard in terms of inventories and it sets you up for a spring dynamic. So I would err on the side of bullishness, keeping in mind when you really slice all of it away with U.S. inventories, you know, close to between, between 450 and 500 million barrels. It's not like crude oils in short supply. Greg, what about the what about the metals here? This is like the first year on a record that we're we we could potentially close up in in gold and oil and treasuries and in stocks in the same year. Uh, or up, I mean, should you just just close your eyes and hit the buy button on gold too? <laughs> yeah, if it were that easy. Um, but if you you know if I had to answer that question, I would say yes. Um, and there's a lot going on here too. The first thing I would point out. Uh, is that what has happened in the last really 12 months, 18 months, it kind of goes back to August of last year, actually, August of 2018. Um, what you have here is a complete you know, break from gold relative to the dollar. Because what you've had is the dollar has rallied. The dollar you know, was testing 99. It looked like it was going to break out and run to 104, which was the 2015-16 high. But gold's going up anyway. When we talked about this last time, you asked me, how was the performance in gold? Because it was just sitting around 1260. And the answer was that I gave you guys was actually the performance is phenomenal considering it should be, you know, 1150 to 1050 given where the dollar is. And if the dollar shows any signs of slowing down, let alone cracking, which it could do based on, you know, what Fed policy is doing, and you're actually getting some contraction now in the yield differentials versus Europe, which has been key in holding the dollar up, uh, that's going to be really bullish for all the commodities. I think you're starting to see that. You're starting to see it in the base metals, copper, uh, zinc, nickel. You're starting to see it in some of the ags, sugar, coffee, cocoa. These tropical softs are kind of poised. You get a dollar crack, uh, particularly below the 95, 85 level, which is still a little bit away, but it's a key level. You get below there, you're going to see some fireworks in the commodities, let alone that you have gold rallying in 
all paper currencies because the biggest picture thing right here is as central banks are now facing potentially another whiff of deflationary influences. All right. They're going to have to keep pumping money and it's becoming less effective, number one. And they're going to have to do more and more just to get the same percentage impact as we move forward. And the confidence in the, you know, the purchasing power of paper is at question here. And that's the biggest long term bullish thing for gold. And I'll make one more quick point on that. If you go back to 1971, this is a secular bull market that just finished a wave four uh, correction looking for a, you know, a major bull move here on the breakout that we just had through 13, 1377 that implies it's going to new highs. And that sounds crazy, but in, in so many other currencies, except for maybe eight to 10 currencies globally, gold has already made new highs. All right, we've been on the line, as we mentioned, with Greg Weldon from Weldon Financial. Greg, as always, thanks for the time. Have a good rest of the week. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Great All energy, right. Greg. Thank you. Oh, lots of energy. 846 here. We've got about four minutes before our next guest. You want to hit on some more earnings? We can do Mattel. Uh, let's go with, let's let's go with do, the toy company. Let's, let's do Mattel here. Uh, getting a big pop this morning uh, from their earnings after the close yesterday. Q3 uh, adjusted EPS of $0.26 cents versus a $0.16 cent estimate sales of one48 First $1.43 billion, so a beat and a beat in the third quarter. They also announced they're searching for a new CFO. Uh, nice pop here um, in the toy company, uh, trading at the highs of the, uh, let's see here. We got a 1277 print. Let me get my after hours chart up here. Uh, up 21%. That's a big move from Mattel, but it only puts it at 1277. Let me go to my pre-market high. Knocking up pre-market highs of the session right here, right now. So we will keep an eye on that. I don't know. You got a gap to fill in this. You had a high just uh, under 1250. So there is some room open here. 1297 fills the gap. So, man, you're right there. You're filling that gap. I don't know. Let's see you get above 13, hold 13, and keep on going. But uh, so this has kind of been range bound, though, yeah. through the last few months. I mean, you get down near 10, you seem to find buyers, and we've been up over 14. So, can you say it stops at 1278? Yeah. That's room to go anywhere. Hard hard to see a nice setup here. You know, yeah, like we always said. It's pausing. It's pausing. Yeah, it's hard. These are hard to trade. Like when they're in the middle of nowhere like this. I mean, swing at you know what Warren Buffett, you know, swing at the pitches that are up the middle. This one's like throwing you a curveball here, you know, try to, to hit it. Sure, maybe sometimes you get a base head off it, but a lot of times you're gonna strike out. So I don't see a setup here at all. Hey Spencer, let's rip a couple more off. Let's rip a couple more off. All right, any particular ones? I mean, we have so many. There I I don't even know. I mean, you, you want to look at like Facebook and Apple since they report after the close today? Sure. Sure. You're the producer. All right. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's look at let's look at Facebook first. Let's do a setup here. Set up this trade for uh, for today or maybe tomorrow since they report later on. So, stock up a buck forty three, getting a lift here with the overall market. Maybe ahead of the report. A lot of times, like I say, stocks like to run ahead of these reports and. That's what we're seeing maybe this morning on Facebook, you know. And uh, I'd look at yesterday's high, 192.53. Maybe there's be some people are sneaking out of there. But the biggest thing is going to be, obviously, the earnings report after the bell. I will quickly grab you that expected move because that's always important. Ah, uh, let's look at that. Look at Facebook here. Mm, looks like you're clearing out some really some nice resistance. Been holding since September. That area, actually, this snuck up to the level I was talking about yesterday. I was talking about like the 192 and a half area. You got the 192.53. So I don't know. I think if you, if they, whatever the number is, they pop it above 192 and a half. I think things look pretty wide open uh, on the downside if they decide to whack it. Um, I like any, let's just call it 182. I see three lows from 181.50 to 182 area. So who knows? I mean, with the way these things have been mm -hmm. moving, 10 and a half expected move there in. Three. Yeah, over 11 even if you're looking at the 190. So it's a big expected move here when you look at 11 points. Um, that would take us up to 200, which is a major resistance point. So again, I find it very difficult to come in here and say, oh, we're going to have you know this crazy quarter by the straddle because we've been in consolidation station here for a while here now, an 11-point move. 
uh, in either direction takes you up to 200 which is probably psychological or takes you down to the bottom of the range so i almost like selling the straddle here more than buying it again i think that you don't make much money trading those options or buying those options all right 850 let's bring on our second guest we're going to take a quick break and grab him larry mcdonald he's the founder of the bear traps report also the global head of macro strategies at acg analytics we'll be right back in a moment here with larry All right, well, welcome back, everyone, to Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel, Joel Alcon, and Dennis Dick. Join now, as I mentioned before, a break by Larry McDonald from the Bear Traps Report, New York Times bestselling author, and the global head of macro at ACG Analytics. Larry, good morning. Hi, Spencer. Great to be with you guys. I want to talk to you about a comment you made uh, that non-U.S. equities are going to outperform U.S. equities going forward. Outline why you think that. Well, the, the dollar has been um, the most profound deception vehicle in the world the last, you know, since 2015. And the Fed is basically in a situation where they, they can't control monetary policy because when they try to control it, it's uh, relative to the rest of the world because so much trade, so much uh, if you look at the SWIFT payment system globally, the amount of transactions that are in dollars are, you know, you're talking about 60 to 80 percent of all transactions, trade, just any kind of transactions are in dollars in the SWIFT system. So as the Fed tries to execute monetary policy uh, in the last five or six, you know, three years, they've really done a, damp a lot of damage to the global economy. So... Net net, the, the global economy has to rebalance. Uh, one one thing that'll help will be the trade deal. Another thing that'll help will be the Brexit resolution. But I think the I think the Fed and the global central banks are all realizing that um, the Fed has to uh, lay down. That's why um, what they've done over the last say four weeks, they've done a term repo facility. So that's a, a longer term repo plan of like two hundred billion. They've done um, a short-term repo uh, programs that are close to $200 billion. And they've done uh, T-bill purchases that they're promising now $60 billion a month. I mean, this is a profound, historic, embarrassing reversal from a Fed that in July, in June and July, they were reducing the balance sheet at $40, to $40 billion a month. And now they're expanding it at hundreds of billions. So net-net, uh, this is very good for the global economy. It's um, it's a it's an aha moment where the Fed's reversing, and it's much better for the global economy what they're doing than than it is for the United States. So how would you then play this? I mean, we've talked about this on our show. The EEM is pretty much done nowhere for a while. Yeah, it's if you look at e, in, e, like Brazil. We, we, uh, I think last time I was on the program, we put, put a major note out last October on Brazil. We've had multiple follow-ups. Love Brazil here. Uh, they, they have the, the bandwidth to cut rates another 100 bips. Uh, so you have big rate cuts, and that's the EWZ. Um, so I think the EWZ will outperform the S&P by yeah, probably 50% over the next three, four, five years. And uh, the EEM is... is Oh, the EM is, 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 a, is a decent ETF to, to capture this, but there's a lot of China exposure. South Korea EWY is another ETF that has been massively underperforming the U.S. in recent years, and uh, I think those three will get you. And then also, you know, the developing markets, the frontier markets, uh, that's another area that will benefit from a, a weaker dollar over the next, you know, say three, say two years. 
Yeah, I, I've been eyeing that Africa ETF for, for a while, but I haven't quite pulled the trigger on it yet. Um, I want to ask you about cannabis. I know you're bullish on cannabis. We talked about this on our show yesterday. We've talked about this on our show a lot, quite frankly. Uh, the, a lot of people are bullish cannabis in the long term. It's a new industry. It's exciting. It's growing. In the short term, you cannot argue they are in a bear market. At, I, I don't really want to know uh, particularly why, why you're bullish cannabis because we've done over that argument a lot. I want to know how you would play it because there are so many companies that like, like companies that I've wanted to buy. I, I've been in these investor presentations at, at our conferences. I've I've seen them and it, it all sounds great, right? When, when you hear it from the CEO, but you know, I mean, how do you decipher the good from the from the crap? There's so much out there. Well, you know, in, in 1996, we founded ConvertBond.com. And we eventually were lucky enough to sell it to Morgan Stanley. So we were, I was part of the, I was a child of the dot-com era. And I saw, you know, hundreds of companies go to zero. And I saw a, a handful of companies over the next, you know, 10 years, 20 years that have, that have up, you know, 10,000%. So there's really no, <laughs> I think guys like Todd Harrison, I mean, uh, CB1 Capital, where you have a professional that's in the industry that's picking a number of stocks. Uh, that's one way uh, that I would recommend somebody that really is 10,000, 25,000 feet deep across the sector. Uh, these ETFs are, um, you know, can, the problem is they're all Canadian. So if the U.S. if the if the U.S. equities are, I think, you know, 60, 70 percent cheaper than the Canadian equities because of the political risk. Uh, but uh, I guess the MJ um, is another you know way to play the sector. But um, it's important that you understand one thing. So we just created uh, this Bear Traps Report special feature on cannabis sector. First time ever. We've never, ever written anything about the sector. So we did this in the last three weeks. And the, the capitulation score that we're getting on the sector. So we have a model that's an artificial intelligence type uh, vehicle that calculates the capitulation relative to the sector, relative to other sectors. The sector's down 80 to 85 percent. And all our math shows us that it was when you have that type of short term swing in sentiment that uh, you have substantial reversal if there's a slight positive catalyst in the new year. And I will tell you, ACG Analytics, our partner in Washington, uh, we've, we've been down there on the hill you know, dozens of times in recent years. We've done a lot of different meetings with different senators, congressmen, not just on cannabis, but on trade, on Puerto Rico, on Fannie and Freddie, but, but recently on cannabis. And the one thing that I would say is, is talking to people around the hill, there's definitely some shift in sentiment. Um, I think that, you know, remember John Boehner's on the board of Acreage. Yeah, he's got a lot of influence on the Hill. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of pressure from the, the, the left-leaning political candidates. There's uh, pressure on the White House not to get a uh, front run on the populism here. In other words, it's the, the left candidates trying to out populist uh, Trump's populism and canvas is just one vehicle where they could try to do that. So all this is adding up for a Q1 surprise Q1 where this legislation is probably going to come through on the Hill. They can tweak it with language. It's going to uh, obviously it's going to get through the house. And uh, I think you got a good chance of it getting through this committee and then onto the Senate floor. And uh, if it gets on the Senate floor out of committee, which I think it will, these you gotta understand these stocks would be up. Just, I mean, I've seen this in the past. These stocks could be up like two, three hundred percent if if there's that kind of momentum in the first quarter, especially coming out of a tax loss selling, vicious Hall of Fame capitulation, which which we just saw in the fourth quarter of 2019. Uh, Larry, uh, one of our uh, listeners uh, would like your comments on a recent. Uh, Recent quote from Ray Dalio, and he said, uh, you know, the big head fund manager says the global economy faces a scary situation. I mean, we have had bears the whole way up in this market. When you're looking at the global economy, interest rates, trade war, I mean, I mean, people just keep saying this. and The market keeps going higher. And any comments on that? Well, the global economy is. is Everybody knows the bear case. It's been it's been widely. I mean, God, for for eighteen months now, 
it's been out there. I mean, the MSCI world is underperforming the S&P by like 30% the last like two, two years. So, uh, you know, the, the, the United Kingdom, I mean, CapEx in the UK, UK equities are underperforming the United States by you know, 100% over the last five years, something like that, 85%. So the bear case globally is out there. Everybody knows about the, the Brexit dark side. Um, China is slowing. Clearly, that's a problem. But the, 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 the underlying dynamic is if, if the global economy pushes the U.S. toward recession, then the Fed, which is starting to happen, the, the Fed backs away. The, the, the consumer in the United States is held up because, remember, there's a trillion dollars of deficit spending. So the consumer, just look at today's GDP. It's a classic tale of two cities. I mean, you've got investment on the uh, corporate side uh, in, in structures that's down 15 percent, worst levels in like five years. And on the um, – on, on the consumption side, you've got, you know, enough great numbers. So the consumer is doing fine. This recession globally in manufacturing hasn't is, is, has leaked over to the United States, but it hasn't hit the consumer yet because uh, because we have this pro-cyclical trillion dollar deficit that is uh, supporting the, the consumption side. And so when the Fed finally gives away, as the, the global economy starts to really inflict more pain on on the U.S., what happens? What will happen is the dollar collapses, and then uh, the global economy. Even though the global economy went led, it's almost like the reverse of 08. This, this time, the global economy is going to lead us into the recession and then lead us out. Uh, whereas ten years ago, the U.S. Was, was leading, and um, so th- this time you want to be underweight the U.S. and overweight uh, global equities like the U.K. All right, Larry McDonald, as I mentioned, is founder of the Bear Traps Report. He's the global head of macro strategy for ACG Analytics and a New York Times best-selling author. Larry, thanks so much for the time today. Thanks, thanks guys. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. All right, 9.02. Uh, I guess that'll be it for our show today. So any final thoughts, either of you? Uh, for me, I mean, we're just creeping higher here, up $2.50, a pre-market session. So uh, I think a little bit of a, you know, two-sided action here maybe go up and test that high from yesterday at 46 and a quarter i don't know feel strong right now so i'm just going to look at that on the upside uh on a pullback here you have a monday and tuesday's interday lows right at 3032 so could be a little bit quiet here ahead of the fed and then you know busting out above 46 and a quarter if We like what we hear from the Fed. No resistance, all-time highs. If we do lose the 30-30 level, though, that was yesterday's low at 29.50, then there's where the key to the downside is for today. All right. That is still around. But just next market. I mean, I'm seeing it, it, it's a tricky one today. You're seeing some stocks weaker, some stock, stock stronger. I'd look at, you know, what was weak yesterday. And if you're seeing a little bit of pop back in those stocks here, maybe that's a selling opportunity. But we've got a lot of rotation going on here. I mean, um, yeah, and I, I'd be very cautious chasing moves ahead of the Fed here. Let's see. Everything's going to matter after 2 o'clock. So you're going to see some big volatility. Probably quiet action before that. Uh, but after 2 o'clock, a lot of things going to change. Big questions. Do they hint at more at another rate cut in yeah. December? And Not up here. Not up here. They're not going to cut in December. I mean, why would they? Market at all-time highs. They got to save some bullets. Global economy, though, Joel. Got to save some bullets in the chamber. Got to keep those bullets. Global economy. They don't. They've used them all up. When <laughs> when are we going to like stop worrying about the rest of the world? I know. I I I haven't understood this whole uh, wor- worry about lowering rates here. And we've talked about this on the show uh, a lot over the like, course of the last six months. I don't understand where it's coming from. So I completely agree with Greg's comments earlier. I don't get it, but. It is what it is. I don't know. He wants to save his job with Trump. All righty. That'll be it. I want to thank both our guests, Greg Harmon and Larry McDonald. Uh, If you missed any part of our show, or Greg Weldon, excuse me, not Greg Harmon, Greg Weldon and Larry McDonald, catch our podcast, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or we watch our show on YouTube. Also, the Benzinga Global Fintech Awards, November 19th in New York City, Fintech Awards. Dot com to learn more. Dennis, Joel, and myself will be there doing the show and doing some training education on the side. 
Uh, please remember all the information from our show meant to be used as informational purposes only, not for investing or trading advice. And that's it. Everyone have a great day. We'll see. How about how about uh, whoo? One final time there. One e- final time. E- easy Mike T beat me to it. So right. uh, one, one final woo. There we go. Everyone have a great one. We'll see. You.